right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Rusty Gaylard, who is in, where are you today, Rusty, actually? San Francisco? I'm in the San Francisco area, yes. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, just up, uh, just up the coast a bit. Uh, and uh, Rusty is the um, <clears throat> Rusty is an executive coach, and you work with uh, you work with Silicon Valley Dream Builders, and you're also an author. And what we're going to talk today about is a really interesting subject: why smart people make bad decisions. Uh, so, Rusty, let's get straight into it. And first of all. Um, when you say, why do smart people make bad decisions? Uh, let's, let's get straight into the, the, the crux of it, because let's face it as if we consider ourselves smart people, we kind of figure that, yeah, we pretty much have our own decision-making process in our head. And it's kind of worked for us, uh, a lot of the time until it doesn't, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it comes to bite us. So why why is it that decision making and i find actually decision making can be something that can be quite crippling for some people um why is decision making so fraught well there, there's a couple of reasons for that john i mean number one is when you when it comes to making a decision especially if you're a smart person you have a lot at stake right we, we're smart people are accustomed to making good decisions it's how you got where you are mm -hmm. uh, and you don't want to make a bad decision and so it's that Part of the part of the challenge is just the the weight that gets put on any one decision. Uh, and so, as you said, decision making can be, can be fraught for people. And a lot of times, it's that fear of making the wrong choice, of making a bad decision, that really gets in people's way. So that's one element. There's also a second element, though, which is that uh, your decision making process works for you until it doesn't. Which is exactly what you said. Uh, many of us come up to this point where the decisions we make, the way we approach our uh, our work and our life, it works very well up until a certain point, and then we get stuck. And the problem is, like smart people, uh, when something goes wrong, what do we do? We go back to what has always worked for us in the mm -hmm. past, and we double down on that. And so by continuing to work hard on using the same tools and techniques that we've always used, we're not making any progress because you're, you're, when, you're, you think, when the going gets tough, you fall back on what's always worked, but what's always worked isn't working in the same way anymore. And so you're stuck, but you're using the same tools and you just go around and around in this loop. That's one of the things I call the A trap because it's this, those tools that got you the A in school, that got you to be the, the A performer in your job and in your career. But at some point, all those same tools end up with you being stuck. And that's why it ends up being a trap. And the other part, uh, Rusty, let's be honest, is um, none of us are taught really how to make decisions none of us are taught a decision making process per se maybe we watch other people maybe we make it up on our own maybe it happens organically uh, and as you say maybe it works for a while but but nobody's really none of us are really taught the process of how to make good decisions yeah absolutely uh, very few people are taught a, a decision making process and fundamentally there are i think it's important to think about decisions in a couple of different ways most decisions you make, the vast majority of decisions that you make are reversible or adjustable. There are very few decisions that you cannot change once they've been made. And that's important to realize. Those decisions that cannot be changed once you've been made and that have a high stake, uh, those are ones that are worth having a very robust decision-making process. Those decisions that can be changed, that can be adjusted, in those kinds of situations, you're much better served by making progress, by making a decision quickly and by moving forward, rather than being stuck in this loop of what is the right choice here? How do I make a decision? What do I need to do? How do I get more information? You can end up in this loop where you're spending lots of time trying to make a decision and you'd be much better off to make a decision to move forward and then learn as you're moving forward, was that a good decision or not? And make adjustments afterwards. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point because I think sometimes today, and this is kind of pervasive, it's not just what we're talking about, but uh, it seems that everything is all, people often put everything on the same level, same priority level, same, uh, so big decision, small decision, medium decision, all treated exactly the same to your point. Um, and that can become, that can become crippling. 
And I mean, I know I know of people who any decision, any decision, they they turn into a, a, an ongoing major process that takes way way too long, and in the end, in the end of the day, um, just stresses them. To be honest, yeah. Absolutely. I, I think a lot of people do that. And so one of the things I encourage uh, encourage people to do is as, for those decisions that you know you can change and you can adjust and you can learn as you go, for those decisions, rather than make this a highly analytical decision process where you're trying to gather all the data, see if you can make come to a decision faster and take action. Um, so one of the things, I actually learned this from my dad, and it's one of the things I love that he used to say is, I may not always be right, but I'm always certain. And you know that was a little intimidating to me when I was young. But what I came to appreciate about that statement is he was certain enough to move forward. He was certain enough to take action. And but he was willing not to be right. And if you can accept the fact that your decision doesn't have to be right, because ultimately, what's more important to you: progress and achieving your goal, or being right. Many of us think those are the same, but they're really not. You don't have to make the right decision all the time in order to reach your goal, but you do have to make decisions and you do have to take action and move forward. And so what's more important to you, reaching your goal or being right? And if you can think about it that way, it lowers the stakes about making the right decision and allows you to move forward and make progress. Yeah, that's like the great relationship advice is, you know, would you prefer to be happy or right? <laughs> that's, that's what most people told me before I got married is just remember that one. Do you want to be happy or do you want to be right? Um, but but it's a great but it's a great point. Um, it's a great point, uh, Rusty, is the fact that we can make, you know, these smaller medium decisions. We can make them. They may not be the right decision. We can recognize that we can learn from it. We can move on. And that and that is progress. When it comes to larger, you know, life-changing decisions or ones that you say, you know, as you said, uh, you know, can't be reversed or can't be easily reversed, how should how should people approach that so they don't make snap decisions or worse, is get stuck and don't make any decisions at all? Yeah. Well, so uh, number one, I think it's really important to just investigate what can be reversed and what cannot be reversed. Mm -hmm. So you talk about major life decisions. Uh, you know, I. I spent the first 25 years of my career working in major corporations. The last 14 years of that was at Apple. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a great company. I had a great job. Many people would be very envious of me for the job that I had. And I chose to leave that job to start my own business as a coach. Now, one of the things that I came to appreciate in that, it felt like a very final decision and it was intimidating mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. But one of the things I came to appreciate was it was reversible. You know, if I went off and started a business and found that I was a total failure and it didn't work and I wasn't able to make it and I needed to go back and get a job. I could do that. I still mm -hmm. had good relationships at Apple. I had worked at Apple for 14 years. I could go to other companies. So, you know, just even questioning, is this a reversible decision? I think that's a really important place to start because there yeah. are very few decisions that cannot be changed or reversed. So that's number one. Uh, the, in terms of making a, a snap decision, you know, I, first of all, I, I don't encourage people to get an idea and then make a, make the snap decision all at once. So, you know, in my example, when I, my first idea to get a coach, after I be, got the idea to become a coach, my first step was not to walk into my boss's office and quit. <laughs> my, my first step was to do some research, to get trained, to get certified, to start doing some work in the world, to get my first clients. I did all of that, which took several months before. I had the conversation with my boss about leaving the job. And there's something important in there. There's an important nugget, which is most of us think that when you make a decision, it requires the, the big, the big decision, if you will, which is, you know, I'm going to leave my job, but there's always multiple smaller steps you can take leading up to that. And it's a way not to get stuck, right? It's easy to get stuck when saying, okay, I think I'm going to become a coach. Now I have to quit my job. That feels very intimidating. It's an easy place to get stuck. And it could be a rash decision. And you can avoid both of those pitfalls by taking some of the small steps by saying, okay, if this is what I want, what's a step that I can take? What's something I can do that moves me forward? And I'll take that step, I'll move forward, and I'll learn as I go. And by the time I got to the point of saying, it's time to leave my job, I was ready. I was prepared. I had a bunch of momentum behind this new business that I was starting, and it felt much more natural. So I think that's an important reminder for people just to say, you can take some small steps and by doing so, you won't, you will avoid the rash decision and you will also avoid the pitfall of doing nothing and just being stuck in indecision. 
Yeah, no, I, I really like I really like what you've outlined there because um, what it does is it it means you can make the decision, but then you execute the decision over a period of time. Um, and what I what I like about that too is again, you know, we live in this culture of everything is instant. Got to go move immediately. Everything has to be super fast. So this idea of of you can make a decision, but then you patiently execute on that decision it doesn't have to be like one day to the next a complete change and and it's nice i mean you made the decision and you went and you started doing the research and building all of this you didn't necessarily need to you know your company didn't need to know people didn't need to know unless you chose to tell them but it allowed you to build up the confidence to say yes this is this is a good decision and i can do this Absolutely. And that, you know, that applies to me when I'm talking about changing my career, um, mm -hmm. but it applies in so many other contexts as well. Uh, whether that's having a courageous conversation with somebody, right? If, if, you know, you're in a work context and you're, maybe you've got someone who's not performing well, that could be on your team. It could even be a peer or even something about your relationship with your boss that isn't working well. And you have this decision to say, I want to change this because this is not an environment that I want to be in. You can start to take some action towards that. It doesn't have to be this, you know, walk in and you know, drop this big bomb on the table saying this is this is not working. But you start taking action and you execute that decision over time. What is the first step you can take? What is the second step you can take? It's so much easier to think about taking action when you can break it down into some of those steps. Uh, and as you take those steps, you absolutely make progress. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then, um, you know, what what then if you take an approach like this and you do it and you do it systematically over time, um, how do you avoid then maybe taking too long over it? Right. I mean, because that's the other part, too, is you can you make the decision and then you start to execute on it. But then maybe you start to think, well, I need everything in place before I actually make that final leap. Yeah, such a great such a great decision. And, and this, you know, I think this ultimately comes back to each person. Uh, you know, and in terms of when it is right to make the final leap. Uh, and, and by the way, I think this is one of the reasons why it's so helpful to have an outside person mm -hmm. supporting you in this journey. And I say an outside person because, you know, so many people I talk to when I say, well, who's your most trusted partner? Who's the person you talk to most openly, you get the best advice from? Most people say it's a family member, a spouse, mm -hmm. a parent, a brother, a sibling. Uh, the challenge with that is that your family members have a vested interest in your success and in your decisions, right? If, you know, if you're talking about a spouse and you're talking about leaving your job, well, your spouse is impacted by that decision, mm -hmm. right? It's not just you. So of course they have, they have an opinion about it. And so having someone outside that you can talk to who doesn't have a vested interest in what your decision is, that's someone who can really help reflect to you and challenge you on your thinking thought process. Are you moving fast enough? Are you moving too fast? Uh, you know, are, are you going at a pace that's appropriate for you? And so I just think that having that kind of support structure is essential. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And I totally agree with you on the family, uh, family or close friends, because at the end of the day, I mean, your family, you know, may love you and have your best interests at heart and all of that, but they may, they have their own biases. They have their own you know, as you say, emotional investment, it can be very positive. It doesn't always, it doesn't always, it's not always the case. Um, but the, the idea of the outside person, I think it's so, so critical. And um, so tell me about when you work with, when you work with people as a coach, and, and I'm a big advocate for, for coaches and having somebody who's just, whose only interest is in your success, nothing else, nothing else. Mm -hmm. um, so when you work with people, how do you help them? Uh, well, first of all, I always start with what is your goal? What's important to you? What does success look like? Right? If we were to, if you were to fast forward one year, two years, three years in your life, and say, "Oh my gosh, I, I'm just at a whole new level of success and performance and fulfillment in my life," what would that look like? So that's where we start, and most of the time that centers around career. But of course, your career impacts the rest of your life, and so we talk about that too. Uh, so that's number one. That's where we start. The second thing is we start to look at what are the things that get in your way of achieving that, right? This is the, well, I've always done it this way, or this is the way it's been. You know, I've just used my example of, I always worked for big companies my whole career, 25 years. I worked for huge companies. I worked for General Electric. I worked for PG&E, which is the utility here in the Bay Area. And mm -hmm. I worked for Apple. These are all massive corporations. To leave that and go become an entrepreneur, that wasn't even in the, you know, that wasn't even on the menu for me. 
So you know, what are the things that aren't on the menu for you because you've just ruled them out? And that's not necessarily a new job opportunity, but that's a new behavior or that's a new style uh, you know, uh, or a new way of interacting with people, a new way of communicating. So these are all things that I help work with people on to find what are their assumptions about their behavior and how they have to show up at work and rethink those, take some of those blockers out of the way so that they can bring a new way of showing up at work. And then of course, there's the, you know, as you, we talked about earlier, is making the decisions and executing them. So taking the action. And so that's also part of the work. And so it's really those, you know, the, those series of, of steps, making really clear, understanding what success looks like, removing some of the obstacles, making the decisions and taking action. Yeah, that I know. I, I love that because let's face it. I mean, we all have our limiting beliefs, and sometimes you know they can be they can be quite powerful. I mean, just the one you outlined there is quite a simple one. You know, hey, I've always worked for a huge corporation. I wouldn't know how to do anything on my own or go to a small startup, and and it can be intimidating. I remember doing it myself, leaving a large company and then moving to a tiny startup and having to start up a satellite office and staring at the four walls and the plastic desk from, from <laughs> Staples or whatever and going, mm, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> yeah. Well, so, I mean, that's, that's a great example in terms of a career change, but you know, I'll, I'll give you another example, which is just inside of your job, right? Like one, one of my clients was a very creative person and he approached problems from different angles. He kind of had a contrarian viewpoint on a lot of things. But whenever he showed up in an executive meeting, he thought he had to be kind of buttoned up and be your typical corporate performer. And so he closed off that whole part of him that was this innovative thinker and this creative approach to, the, to, kind of, to work. And he shut that down because he thought, well, I've got to be buttoned up and I've got to be a professional just like all the executives are. So recognizing that and working with him on that, he started to bring more of his true gifts Right. And, you know, it wasn't like he was intentionally stirring the pot, but the kinds of questions he asked did stir the pot. And he started to build a reputation for himself as an innovative thinker and as a strategic thinker. And he became a sought after thought partner for all sorts of groups across the company because he started to bring more of his gifts and more of his true talent, his true natural way of working to the table. Whereas before, he always thought that was off limits because he said, well, I work in a corporate environment. I've got to be corporate when I'm in a corporate environment. So I just wanted to give a, you know, yeah. it's easy to talk about the changing job scenario, but all of these limiting beliefs apply in your job and the way you show up and do your job as well. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I'm glad you raised that as well, because I do think that um, there's probably a lot of people who who will listen and watch this and that will resonate with them where they say, yeah, you know, there's more I could do or there's things that I could do or there's things I hold back um, in a work context or in, in a broader context. Um, whatever and uh, and the to be able to make the decisions to start to reveal yourself a little more i mean that can be scary that can be to be honest that can be scarier than switching jobs to be honest well absolutely uh and so we're coming back to like well okay why do smart people make bad decisions mm -hmm. <laughs> right it's <laughs> like can you make a decision to be more of yourself because of course we all know at this kind of deep intuitive level when you are most yourself you're going to be the most effective and you're going to be happiest uh, now, so many of us, though, try to be someone that we expect others want us to be. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's part of this bad decision making. And it's, you know, it's risk averse. And, you know, there's some fear associated with really showing up as yourself, whether that's dressing the way you like to dress or cracking jokes, if you've got a good sense of humor or, you know, whatever, it, like this other person I said, you know, with kind of a different way of approaching thinking and approaching problems. So many of us, and I, I was this person too, uh, you know, I, I tried to be the good corporate citizen and show up that way for many, many years when I worked in big companies. Uh, so we all have some version of that. And yet we know intuitively that we would be happier and we know that we can do our best work when we're most fully ourselves. So how do we start to strip away those walls and those barriers that hold us back from who we really are so we can show up at work and be our best self, do our best work, be happier and perform better? Yeah, no, it it is, and it it is, and I think that, uh, and I think do people feel so much pressure to be a certain way, and it probably even more so now because there's so many different influences and influences out there, and people are kind of, and and people don't know which way to turn or whatever. So, but but you don't have to, like we said earlier about making decisions, you don't have to reveal yourself all at once. I mean, you can do it, you can do it gradually, and you can reveal the parts that you think are appropriate for the situation you're in.
Of course, of course. And, you know, w- one of the ways I've heard that described is the 15% rule. So if like, if you've got a great sense of humor and you want to bring that more fully into work, you might, instead of bringing 100% of your sense of humor, start with 15%. Like I'm going to bring 15% in and I'm going to share an idea or a joke or you know, crack a joke or something, something small, one time and see how it goes, right? If the 15% test goes well, then you next time you say, oh, it was well received. I, you know, it all went well. So next time I'm going to do 30%, right? So you bring, you start with a small slice and you can, you can increase that. You can grow that over time until you get to the point where you can be more fully engaged and fully authentic as you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Rather than walking in one day and doing a stand up comedy routine. <laughs> and, uh, <yeah. laughs> well, listen, Rusty, this has been fantastic. I mean, such, such phenomenal insights. And I love the, I love the fact that you are a coach for this. I mean, this is phenomenal and for helping people because I really think people need help. People don't, you know, they get bad advice all the time. Well-meaning, but bad advice right. often. And and having that external person, you know, really, really helps. So all of Rusty's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your business. Absolutely. So uh, I, I am based here in Silicon Valley. and. Uh, I'm an executive coach for uh, high-performing, ambitious people who want more success without more sacrifice. Uh, I really do believe that all the things that we're talking about is about stripping away the things that get in your way rather than adding a bunch of new things. So it's not like, oh my gosh, I'm already busy, I'm already maxed out, and I'm not gonna. Your coach is gonna ask you to do even more. It's not about that. It's about doing less of the things that block you so that you can show up more and more as your best self. Fantastic. I love it. So listen, I'd encourage you to go check out Rusty. As I said, all the links to be below. Um, I told you, as I said earlier, I'm an advocate for coaching. We all need help. And uh, it's always great to have somebody who's purely invested in your success. All right. But listen, thanks again, Rusty. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon.